And we are live. Welcome, folks, to episode 3429 of the Survival Podcast on a very cold uh, early, I guess, Monday. I was going to say Monday morning, but it's really early afternoon. It's still in the, the mid-teens here. I think it's 14 degrees right now. Uh, it was interesting to watch all the uh, left-leaning, compassionate individuals on Twitter yesterday literally cheering on, hoping that the Texas grid would fail, so they had something to complain about in regards to uh, Governor Abbott. Not that I'm a huge proponent of the governor of Texas, but the way these people have held on to this for three years is the only thing they really have to uh, to constantly bitch about when they don't care at all. Are these the same people? Are these the same people that when we were not following all the COVID stupidity, we're cheering on us, on, like, we hope you die? Anyway, nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. It just an observation. I often talk about the weather, weather because I consider you guys friends, and that's what friends do. They talk, and one of the things friends talk about is the weather. So yeah, it's cold here, uh, but we're doing just fine. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about my entire program for soil fertility. We can't give you everything in a show like this, but we're going to give you an overview of the three things that do the three things that I talk about. My entire soil building and fertility uh, mindset can be brought together with just three world words. And I've talked about it before, build, increase, and hold. And as I've been putting together the course on composting, I've done tons of work on biochar for you guys. Did, just did a show not too long ago on cover cropping. I realized something. Those three techniques have become my go-to tactics for building incredibly resilient garden beds and, and things like that. And you guys have seen the production that comes out of my gardens. It's not just a lot. It's beautiful produce. And it's it's some of the best food you'll ever eat, in my opinion. And it comes down to, again, build, increase, and hold. Because all of the soil that I've started with on this property bluntly sucks. It's either uh, black central Texas prairie clay. Or in, in most, most instances, it's even worse than that. It's whatever I could buy to fill in my big, giant, huge raised beds, because there's no way I'm going to grow in, you know, pure compost in, in that kind of quantity. We're talking, you know, dozens of yards of material to fill in all the raised beds. But it's been a combination of using compost, compost teas and extracts uh, to build the initial fertility, then using cover crops to continuously increase the fertility, and then over the past year and a half, two years, biochar to hold the fertility. And so this is a philosophy that I developed and then slowly developed the tactics that most did that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And what I call it is the trifecta. It is the trifecta of soil fertility. Build, increase, hold, down to compost, cover crop, and biochar. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we do, let's hear from our sponsors of the day. And I actually, my first... What I'm going to bring up for you today is you're really a sponsor. I have been asked by Matt Powers, who is just an awesome dude. The work that he's done as a citizen scientist for soils is incredible. He has a big program going on starting tomorrow all through the week till Saturday called Our Future, Our Regenerative Future. Uh, and it is going to be awesome. There's a huge number of speakers that are available uh, to be seen on it. I'll, I'm going to bring the schedule up here so you can kind of get an idea if you're on the video anyway. Tomorrow, January 16th, there's a bunch of people speaking. Some guy named Jack Spirico will be talking about uh, bioreactor compost that day. And then at 1 p.m. tomorrow, there is a um, Grow Food Now live panel. And I will be on that with uh, Stephen Reiser, Matt Powers, and I think one other individual. You can see who we have on the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th. And if you look on the 20th, you'll see my name there again, kind of late in the lineup. That will be a presentation by me on building online communities that work, uh, relate, uh, that, that result in real world action. And we'll be talking about a lot of the folks uh, from this community who have built up incredibly successful endeavors that initially started as part of the survival podcast community. So not just how to build a virtual community or virtual communities or build a successful online business, but how do you do that in a way that actually inspires people to take action in the real world, form relationships and do things on their own. Uh, there's also a start your business now panel on Saturday at 1 PM. I will be involved with that as well, as long as I can make the timing 
workout. I just found out that Matt wants me involved with that. So there's what's coming with that. Now, moving on to our sponsors of the show. Sponsor of the day, number one today, Berkey Filters. That's at usaberkeyfilters.com. This is, of course, Jeff the Berkey Guy Gleason, a guy that has been you know, involved with our community on and off over the years for a long time. He was gone as a sponsor for a couple of years. We've brought him back on board. I'm glad to have him here. I look at it this way. The best way in the world to make sure your water is safe to drink all the time is use a Berkey filter. It's a gravity-fed system. It works really well, and it cannot fail. Um on, you know, adding on to that, though, you should probably get your Berkey from, you know, like the number one Berkey dealer in the country. That would be Jeff, the Berkey guy, Gleason, not some dude that started selling Berkey stuff yesterday at gun shows or something like that. So definitely check out Jeff, uh, usaberkeyfilters.com. Uh, next up, John Bush with Live Free Academy. Uh, he runs all kinds of really great events that have one in the pipeline right at the moment. But if you want to make sure you miss nothing from John Bush, uh, check out uh, livefree.academy uh, forward slash TSPC or just use the link in the uh, audio notes for the podcast. Uh, it'll be up about, oh, about 30 to 40 minutes after this live stream ends and uh, get on over there and you can sign up and you can get notified of all the cool things John's doing. And something to know about Live Free Academy, it's not just a great source of information and education. Well, John is, you know, he's a, he's a guy like me. He doesn't hate money or anything. Uh, but he also believes in giving away more than people expect. So almost everything that he does, almost every event he does has a free option. So if you're on the email list, you won't miss any of it. Oh, on the on the thing tomorrow with the um, our future with Matt Powers, that's to watch it real time is all free. There are some paid upgrades. But if you want to see my presentation, all these other great presentations, these panels, uh, if you watch them as they are presented, they'll all be free. All you do is sign up for uh, notification and what have you. All right. So let's dig into it. Uh, again, I want to start out with kind of the impetus for today. And as I built the bioreactor composting course, um, it became more and more evident that this was the case. Sometimes you can actually be doing something and not really realize what you're doing, how you're doing it, or why you're doing it. And so I've been making compost, uh, bioreactor style compost in earnest now for this is my fifth year of doing it. It is it has legitimately changed everything. I also kind of gave up a lot on some of the broader scale stuff that we do here, just realizing that if you have four inches of soil, you plant a tree in it or may or may not make it. But if you have three years of drought, it's going to be really tough, even with, you know, some supplemental irrigation. And I've gone on to focus on more intensive systems more intensive systems. And, and this program has kind of coalesced and come together as I have forced myself to continue to educate myself. I'm now in my 50s and I'm still trying to learn something new about soil or gardens or plants every single day of my life. And I plan on doing that until they throw me in a box and, and, and set me on fire, make ashes out of me and scatter me to the wind. I will never stop learning. But as we age, it's a little bit harder to do. Uh, we don't have quite the intellectual curiosity we do when we're younger, but I, I strive to always do that. As I've done that, you, you, you get into a point where you start to learn things. And because you've messed around long enough in your life about someday, one day, you just start doing. You just start doing. And that's, that's something I've always tried to do as well, to actually take action. And as an educator, a podcaster, a content creator, to take action sometimes that I know are going to fail. And if you do that enough, you find the things that work. And as I've built this latest course, I've realized what's really become the powerhouse driving uh, our annual food production here at, at Nine Mile Farm. And it is compost, cover crop, biochar. And probably the linchpin and why I went first with it with course creation is the compost. The other things are important, but if we if we don't jumpstart the biology in systems that are largely biologically dead today, then we're not going to get anywhere. So let's start off with how compost, specifically bioreactor style compost, builds soil fertility. Um, what we're looking for is a low pH compost. Now that's relative to compost that is made from typical high turn systems. So a typical high turn system will have a pH, a typical compost that everybody makes, met, you know, Berkeley method, uh, turn it every three days or what have you. You can end up with a, 
a, a pH of about seven and a half to eight and a half. It's actually uh, quite a high pH. I, I think a lot of people don't realize that. With bioreactor compost, we're able to end up with a compost that's typically somewhere between 6.0 and 7.5. And that's, that's fantastic. Worm compost will typically be right at 7.0 or neutral. And this is good for everybody. I want to put that out. Even if you have somewhat acidic soils, they, we're, and the acidic nature of the soil, the pH is too low, uh, and you want to bring it up with liming or something like that, you're not going to hurt it with compost that's a 6.8 or a 7.0. But if you have soils that are up, you know, 7.8, 8.2 and, and higher some places uh, in a lot of the country, alkalinity is the issue, uh, not, not acidity. Uh, having that compost be in that that neutral range or a little bit lower, a little bit acidic is very, very beneficial. Um, it is also the case that we want low salt in our compost, low salt. And that's I think people don't realize that there's actually a lot of salt. In, in, in fact, in most commercial compost, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of salt. And the reason is that a lot of these commercial operations are sourcing... Uh, feedlot and dairy manure as, as part of their compost operations. And I agree that we have to do something with it, but the the feed that goes into those animals is, is, is actually quite high in salt minerals. Then when we do a high turn rapid thermophilic compost method, we actually create more salts with, with, with the processes that bind elements together. And so you can end up with a compost that by dry weight is 5% salt. In fact, feedlot, uh, I'm sorry, uh, dairy manure is typically dry weight dairy manure pure by itself, which people spread straight on fields, it can be 5 to 10% salt. Think about that. You put a ton of, uh, of dairy manure out on a field and the dry weight is a ton anyway. That's 2,000 pounds. You can have anywhere from 100 to 200 pounds of salt that you just spread on your field. And so by making our own compost and not using these high salt manures, and by using this slow one-year composting process, this is what you get when you do bioreactor compost. You get a low salt and low pH, but more importantly, a bioactive compost. There is a mindset pervasive in agriculture today and gardening, et cetera. And this is from conventional all the way up to even no-till organic, it is all chemical solutions. And I know sometimes people say, well, no, it's not really, Jack. You know, if you're using, if you're doing real organic and you're using even a fertilizer like you recommend, which I do, Dr. Earth is a great organic fertilizer. That's not a chemical solution. Oh, but it is. It's a chemistry solution. It may not be an artificial chemical engineered in a lab solution, but if we're using, you know, manure and guano and uh, things like that. Now there is biology in that particular fertilizer, but we're still, what we're doing is we're saying there's not enough nitrogen in the soil. Let's put nitrogen in the soil. There's not enough phosphorus available in the soil. Let's put phosphorus into the soil. See, that is a chemically uh, driven solution. And the problem with that is you, you, you get into a position where back when I was a marketer, I had a client that, that was willing to pay us a lot of money, but they also wanted education to go along with it. And their question was, when do we get off therapy and when do we start reducing therapy? And what he meant is, when can we pay you less and you do less and we take over? And it was, well, how dedicated are you, right? Uh, and and how, how, how well can you learn and what staff do you have that will take these roles on? We'll do whatever you want as long as you want until you want to take it over. And we'll always support you, et cetera. Well, Think about your garden that way. When does it get off therapy? When does it get off drugs? When do you stop bringing in all these elements that are from off your site to keep it going? And until you get there, you have a system that is inherently not sustainable. And I know there's a lot of this whole sustainable versus regenerative discussion in our space today. And people like Paul Wheaton say sustainable means barely hanging on. No, actual sustainability is got to be regenerative or it's not sustainable. You could say it's sustainable. Well, for how long? If it's infinitely sustainable, it becomes regenerative. Well, if you are putting 
inputs into your garden every year, it's 0% sustainable. You can't sustain it the second that that's cut off. Now, I, I want to be clear when I say this. I'm not saying this year, if you go out and based on what you've learned from me or somebody else in the past, you look at your garden and you go, oh, that looks like a deficiency in calcium and magnesium. I'm not saying don't go out and get a good foliar uh, calcium magnesium supplement like I re recommend on my website and, and, and foliar spray your, your plants and get it through. I'm saying that that can't be the plan forever. If that's the plan forever, then you constantly are looking at a chemistry-based solution versus a biology-based solution. Because the truth is, there's probably enough calcium and magnesium in your soil on your property right now for your plants to live for 100 years without you bringing any more in. They just can't get to it. And if we fix the biology, the chemistry will self-correct at least 90% or more of the way. And then we can do little tweaky things toward the end. And if we have to bring in a little bit of input here and there, that's not a big deal. But if we're bringing in significant inputs every year, we'll never get off therapy. So that's what this bio, bioactive compost does for us. Um, we also need to be using this compost, not just throwing compost on top of our gardens or digging it in or whatever. We should be using either compost teas or compost extracts. And they should be used you know, frequently. So once we get our garden started and up and running for the year, instead of like mid-season, let's go ahead and add more uh, fertilizer. And, and again, if it's necessary, if your plant is indicating that it's got a nutrient deficiency, deficiency and you can easily correct it, you should. But your goal should be to make the need to do that less and less and less and less every day. You see what I'm saying? Um, but... If we are going to keep the biology growing, we can do very simple things. So compost tea is something that people get really finicky about and air stones and all. And I've talked about how to make it. And I've gotten to a point now, I almost never make compost tea that way anymore at all. Air stones, sugar, additional inputs or whatever. No, I take some compost. And I put a five-gallon strainer bag, paint strainer bag in a five-gallon bucket. And I put about a, a half a gallon of compost in there. I fill it up, you know, so there's some headspace left with, with, with uh, the water so it, it doesn't splash over. And you can either mix it with a stick. I throw air stones in it, not for the oxygen so much because it's not going to take very long to do this. It's so I don't have to sit there and stir it. And I'll let that agitation happen. And then you strain it out, squeeze it out, and you apply that. Well, if you're growing, you know, a, a typical garden, peppers, tomatoes, beans, etc., that's plenty to load up a sprayer and spray your plants once every two or three weeks through your growing season. And whatever's left, go ahead and drench wherever it looks like it's most needed. You're constantly infusing more biology into that. And it's very, very simple. It doesn't take a lot of work. It takes less work to do it than it does to explain what I just explained. If you, if you were a kid and you used to make mud pies... It's kind of like that, except you strain the mud out and then you put the liquid on the plants. That's it. That's a biologically driven solution. You also should be using your compost when you're doing your starts. If you're starting your own plants, if you've graduated past going in nurseries and buying plants from other people and you're actually, you know, starting your own seedlings for set out. Then the way I make my potting soil now is I use nothing but pure compost from my bioreactors. I screen it and I add about 10% by volume biochar and mix it in, finely granulated biochar. And, and that's pretty much all that I do anymore. I will use some rock dust and uh, some other amendments and stuff that I won't get into today. But even if I didn't, that would really be all that you need. And what happens is pretty amazing. You look at this compost uh, in a container before you put the biochar into it. And it looks nice, but you put the biochar in it and the entire structure seems to change. And what happens is you uniformly distribute the biochar by mixing it in. The moisture in the soil evenly distributes as the biochar takes in the moisture and you get this wonderful crumb structure. And what ends up happening is you have this plant that is basically a bomb of biology and, and and biochar going into your garden every year. And we'll talk more about the biochar in a bit. 
but you end up with these incredibly healthy seedlings that have all this biology already in interaction with its root system. And I want to grab something real quick here to make my point. Sorry for the delay, guys. And if you're on the audio only, you'll have to look up this part of the video if you want to see it. This is a, a cutting of, of a plant called longevity spinach. And this is this is not even biochar. This is just pure compost out of one of my bioreactors. This isn't even uh, screen. This is just I took this cup, I filled it up, and I stuck the cutting in it. And this is this is what happens when you're using biology for plants. The way this plant, how thriving this plant is. This has been sitting in my garage under a, a not so great plant light for a couple months, and it's explosive with growth and new growth, again, on a stuck cutting, just a pure cut and stick cutting. I do this every year with my longevity spinach. So as one of my students gave me a cutting of it because it won't live through the winter. So I just take a couple of cuttings, bring them inside. And I don't have the other ones. I, I brought these in in case it froze in the garage. It hasn't yet, so I haven't lost any plants, but I brought two of them in. But if you put this side by side, I did this this year, and I took Fox Farms um, forest soil, which is really a great bioactive soil. I mean, if you're going to buy potting mix, it's some of the best you can get, you know, and um, it's dramatic. The difference, the, the growth in the stuff in the compost is 2x. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. If you took my compost and you sent it off for NPK analysis against the Fox Farms product, the Fox Farm product has more nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium than my compost does. I guarantee you that. I guarantee you that it's a very small amount of actual NPK you end up with in this compost. But this is the growth you get. And you get this growth because biology is more important than just raw nutrient value. So if you're starting your peppers, your tomatoes, et cetera, your eggplants, all of the plants that you start as plants and then set out in this, this is the kind of initial growth that you get. And I'd much rather put that plant into the ground with an incredibly healthy uh, systemic reaction going on than put it in there. And it looks really big and it looks really nice, but it's all chemically driven. So the minute that plant starts to have to fend for itself, that's why you put these plants on the ground. And I'm not talking about transplant shock. I'm talking about two weeks later. And that plant just looks like it hasn't grown at all since you put it in, in there. It's still in an adaptation phase. It's trying to get from this point where everything was perfectly chemically provided to it to a place where it has to earn a living. And it earns a living through interaction with soil microbes. If you've done this, if you've started in a bioactive uh, uh, media like this compost, that plant's already been doing that since it came out of the seed, since it first sprouted, since the first root came out. As soon as those first rootlets pop out of that seed and start going down into that container, those symbiotic relationships begin to form. And there is no way long-term Total yields over time can be beaten with this because this is nature and nature is undefeated. Make sure that you're, you're kind of getting that, I guess. Uh, moving on. With that, if you are going to put like beans, corn, et cetera, into your garden, you're going to direct seed. And I'm a huge fan of direct seeding, by the way. There's certain plants that we just we gain so much grow time before we hit in Texas, the heat of our summer. For those of you, like say in the Northeast, like I used to live in Pennsylvania, peppers, tomatoes, et cetera, what you do is you shorten your, your, you have a very short growing season to begin with. So you get longer time to grow. So you're trying to extend your total season. We're trying to get production before the heat comes in in July and just kill, even if the plant lives, it kills production for a, a few weeks. We get to the end of August, we get a little bit cooler temperatures and production comes back in all our fruiting plants. But you're just going to be so far ahead using compost like this. If you're direct seeding, we, there's a couple things we can do. We can put a little compost in the trench or in the hole with the seed. But the other thing we can do, and this is a fantastically easy thing to do, any of your larger seeds, you make a slurry. So basically uh, almost like a pudding mixture looking level of uh, compost extract, if you want to call it that. And then you coat your seeds in it. You spread them out and you let them dry. And those microbes begin immediately to recognize that seed for what it is. It's kind of the same thing you do with a, a legume inoculum, except you can do this with all seeds. Let those seeds dry and then plant them. 
they will take off much quicker. They will form those symbiotic relationships from birth, from the hatch out of the seed, from that first sprout of root and plant. They'll begin that process instead of having to adapt to it over time. And that's just basically giving them a head start. It's like a kid that goes to pre-K will probably excel in first grade over the kid that only went to kindergarten, that type of thinking. Moving on. Um, everybody talks about something I just mentioned, nitrogen fixing legumes. Plant peas or beans or whatever, and they fix nitrogen. And there are uh, rhizobacterium that will form symbiotic relationships with the roots of your legume species, your vets, your peas, your beans, et cetera. And they're very effective and they fix a lot of nitrogen per plant relative to the whole. That's great. But there's over 20 species of what are called free living nitrogen fixing bacteria in well-made bioreactor compost. What is a free living nitrogen fixing bacteria? It's exactly what it sounds like if you break it down. Free living. It does not require plant root or specifically a legume species to fix nitrogen. It fixes nitrogen all by itself as part of its metabolic process. Over 20 species. So where am I going to get my nitrogen from? Well, 70 per, every time you inhale, 78% of the air you inhale is nitrogen. And since what you do is convert uh, oxygen into CO2 and then respirate it, 78% of the air that comes back out of your lungs is still nitrogen. It's an incredibly stable element. That's why it makes up so much of our atmosphere. So 78% of all the air around you is nitrogen, and you're buying it to put it into the soil. All you need is a, biolog a biological element in the soil that takes that nitrogen and puts it into the soil. And this kind of compost will do that for you. In fact, bioreactor compost has over 400 species of beneficial bacteria when examined with something called metagenomic testing. That's we know what we're looking for and we're searching for this particular DNA. Is it there? And what they test for is about when they do this metagenomic testing is 750 known species and subspecies of bacteria and fungi that are beneficial to soil agriculture. And you end up with, you know, almost 500 species in reality. But I'm pretty comfortable saying anybody that does it halfway right is going to end up with over 400. There's something more important about this slow, uh, small, slow solution, right? That's a permaculture principle that is bioreactor composting. The longer you age it, the greater the total diversity, but the greater the distribution of diversity. So if you take this compost at six months and use it, you can. It'll work. It's not the best policy. It's not the best practice. It will have 400 plus species at six months, but about 20 will make up 80% of the total. You see how that works? 20 About 20 individual species. Of that 400, will make up 80% of the total volume of microorganisms. If you give it a year, if you give it a year, it'll be almost 100 species that make up the top 80%. So the diversity is extreme. And this is why we tend to do extracts versus teas. When we make a tea and we give it sugar and air for a day or two, we explode the microbial population, sure. But what microbes? Well, the ones that most like what we did. When we just make an extract and apply it, we kind of leave this broad distribution so that all of these organisms can find their own little niche on our property and our gardens and with our plants. And it's just so much more effective. So let's move on now to cover crops. So we've done the build. We've taken a piece of, of ground, even if it's just a couple four by eight beds that had shit for fertility. We introduced a biological solution and the best compost that can be made from our own materials. So we know what went into it. And now we've got this bioactive system. We've built fertility. Now we need to start growing it and increasing it. Well, there's a lot of soil organisms that don't really thrive unless they're interacting with living roots. Okay. And there's some that really can't do anything. So everybody, mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal fungi, yeah. Let's say you went out and bought the best mycorrhizal inoculant you can get your hands on. You completely saturated a garden bed with it. And you walked away for a month and came back, but you didn't plant anything. There's probably no active, unless there's a weed or two for them to work with, there's no active mycorrhizal fungi in there. They need a living root to work with. 
So we're not going to get the fungal hyphae into this network throughout our soil, not the mycorrhizal ones anyway, without a living root to interact with. If we're going to need a living root to interact with, and we get to the end of our season, we harvest everything, and we're even good ants, man. We, we put down some mulch, and then over the mulch, we put down a tarp. That's a, that's a reasonable strategy. It will result in a very nice planting bed for you in the spring. There's no doubt about that. I've even caught it. And if you can't do anything else, you don't have time to do anything else, it's okay. But it's not going to increase your fertility over that period of time. It'll prevent weeds. It'll give you a nice planting. It'll give a home to worms for a while while they're eating the residues. But if you want to increase the fertility, you need those living roots in the soil. The other thing you need is the dogs are going nuts because the heater on one side of the house ain't working right. So they're here to fix it up. That's what that is. Nothing I can do, guys. I got to keep going on. Um, it keeps an armor on the soil. And that's why if you can't do cover crop this year or whatever, I say give it a mulch, give it a tarp, because at least you have armor on the soil. Nature abhors a vacuum. We've all heard that phrase, and that's because it's real. That's because it's real. Nature will fill a vacuum with something. So if you don't keep an armor on the soil, you will get weeds. If you don't keep an armor on the soil, you will get erosion. When it rains, you will see little particles of your soil spread off. And we get very spoiled in a garden, right? In a garden environment, we've got, let's say, six, four by eight raised beds. Very, very typical. Adding a little bit of soil to all doesn't seem like a big deal. But if you lose, the thickness of a single sheet of paper across one acre, you've lost a ton. And as gardeners, permaculturists, homesteaders, et cetera, we can't sit here talking shit about big ag, and we won't do the simple things necessary to prevent that loss of a ton per acre. Think about it this way, though. 10 sheets of paper is pretty thin, isn't it? You might not even notice it in a raised bed. That's 10 tons per acre of loss. It doesn't matter that you've only lost it across 32 square foot or 10 of them will be 320 square foot, right? You still have the same loss. And you have a much more forgiving system where it should never happen. So we want armor on that soil. And let me tell you something else about keeping armor on the soil. That when you have a disturbance that results in bare soil, and there are no weeds there, that's even worse. That means that soil is so disturbed, so compacted, so something wrong with it, that even weeds don't want to grow in it. And so we want that armor and we want that living root system at all times. If we don't have that, we're never going to increase, let alone hold our fertility. Now, the next thing is, and this may not seem directly applicable to soil health, but it is. By using cover crops, we attract beneficial insects. Beneficial insects largely are pollinators and predators. We want predators because the uh, pest insect species, that's their food. And let me explain something about chemical versus a biological solution again. If you're a bug of some kind that I hate, and I don't want you in my garden, I certainly don't want a large population of their, you in there competing with me for my food, then it, you are basically wildebeest on the Serengeti, and I want lions to eat you. Now, there's two things I need for that to happen. I need the lion to be there, and for the lion to be there, I need you to exist there too, to a degree. If we went into a, a beautiful preserve in Africa with a healthy population of lions, and leopards, and other predators, and we killed all the plains game, they'd kill each other for a while, and then they would leave. They, they, they'd climb fences if they have to. They'd go somewhere where the food is. right? So if we wipe out the pests in our garden, if that's our solution, that's a chemical. The only way to do it is chemical. Then our predators, even if we don't kill them, they leave, or they never show up. Because you know what, you if you're an insect and I spray you with toxins and I kill all of you except a few, then the people that, sur the, the, the insects that survive, people, the insects that survive are going to breed and they're going to pass down their resistance to that pesticide. 
It's called evolution, and we can accelerate it by doing things like that to our own demise. But if I have a population of beneficials and I have all of this activity going on and I'm bringing in ladybugs and lace wings, et cetera, you do not become immune to being eaten. If you are an insect and a lace wing eats you or a ladybug eats you, there is no immunity to that. You do not become immune. You die when you get eaten. So by building up our population of beneficials with cover cropping, it's right down to the point that we're, we're even down and within the soil, we're increasing beneficial nematodes that kill pest nematodes. Or we're trapping pest nematodes in the root structure of plants that we're not really that worried about and are much more able to resist them. Marigolds would be an example. Marigolds in your summer gardens will trap and kill many of the nematodes that would otherwise bother the plants that you see as productive plants. And the marigolds don't care. The marigolds basically eat the nematodes that actually mess up other plants. That's just one example of how that works. Um, the other thing we want to do is we want to open up soil channels and we want to cause aggregation. Those two are very important. So I think it's because these two things are what results in infiltration. If you don't want rain to take your soil away, remember, every time a rain event takes away one sheet of paper of thickness, you can't even see it on the edge. I can't even get it on edge for the camera. That's a ton per acre lost. And if every rain event does it and you get 10 big rain events a year, you lost at the rate of 10 tons per acre of your best soil, your topsoil. So if the rain goes in instead of across, we stop that. That's called infiltration. We do not have a runoff problem. For all my talk of runoff, runoff's not really the issue. We have a lack of infiltration problem. So when I talk about opening channels, let's say we plant something like great big um, daikon radishes as a cover crop. And they go in and they're two foot long and they're as big around as your wrist. And then they die. It's real easy to get your head around that hole that they leave. Even after it starts to fill back in some, it's going to let a lot of water in instead of across. But the aggregation is more important because the, 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 the channels open by cover crops while their roots are you know, being uh, broken down. And as they remain open for a while, that's temporary. But aggregation, if we do it right, is permanent. And what I mean by aggregation is when you dig up, right, when you dig up, this guy's asking my credentials on this. Google me, dude. You're talking shit. You don't know anything. If you don't know who I am, go find out instead of sitting here bitching to other people. And don't even bother with him, guys. He's not important. Um, <laughs> he probably has no credentials. I just noticed this. It's some guy named Dan Wise. Wise, sure. Anybody that puts Wise in their name is probably not. Anyway, aggregation, when you take a shovel and you take a sample of your soil, especially up near the surface, right? All right, I'm done with you. Here, watch this. Uh, we'll put him in a timeout for a minute. We'll see if he calms his little ass down. Oh, G Mom Merkel, I'm gonna have to figure out how to unban you. I did not mean to do that. I banned the wrong person. Damn it! All right, we'll fix it. Okay, you're going. He's gone. I, I just don't need hecklers while I'm doing a live stream. And Gmail Merkel, I'm sorry if you can still hear me. I will fix this. I, I'll have to find out how to find uh, where that happened and, and turn it off because I don't have it here. Uh, I just don't need people like that in, in our lives. We really don't. Um, yeah, anybody that wants to know my credentials can spend two minutes on Google and find them. Uh, anyway, um, back to the aggregation. When you take a shovel sample of your material, and you look at it, especially up at the surface, it should look like cottage cheese. It's your little balls. That's aggregation. And that aggregation comes from biogels from the biology in your soil. And that those biogels create that crumb structure in your soil. It's, it's, it's the thing that we all intrinsically know, even if we have no experience. When we dig up that soil. Um, we, we can look at it and we see it and we just immediately know, even if we don't have a background in this, that's good looking dirt. It's dark, it's crummy, right? And that aggregation is what creates that infiltration. If you think about it this way, if I were to take a really fine powder and pack it down 
and dump water on top of it, you get very little water going down into the soil, right? And the finer the structure and the more dense the compaction, like let's say compacted clay, the harder it is for water to get in. What do we line a pond with if we have it available? Clay. We compact clay, we'll hold water for longer than we live. Clay is incredibly fine particle sizes. So if we have a clay gar clay as our main garden subsoil and we want infiltration, then we, we either have to replace it, which is not practical, or we have to create a crumb structure in it. Because if we turn around and we take another box right next to the one we filled up with a fine powder and packed down, we fill it with gravel. Say gravel about the size of peas, and we pack that down as tight as we can. We don't add any other material to it. We dump water in that. What's it going to do? It's going to straight down, right in. So if we create that aggregation combined with open channels, when we get a rain event, we get almost no runoff, and we get very, very good infiltration, all right? Uh, and that is incredibly important, and that's a huge part of what cover crops allow us to do. The other thing is we want to fix and scavenge nitrogen. Now, I talked about these, these free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and they're an important part of this system. But I'm not saying we don't need legumes. I'm not saying they're not incredibly beneficial. We can take a handful of something like winter pea seed and of like five cents worth of, of, of an inoculant and make a slurry and mix that together and put that into our garden, fix huge amounts of nitrogen. So we definitely want to fix nitrogen. But the other thing we want to do is scavenge it. Scavenge it. Scavenge it from previous applications in some way, whether it's a, it's a, uh, a, a you know, we're adding, um, a fertilizer. I'm just distracted. I, I feel so bad that I, I banned somebody who's always here. Again, Gmail Merkel, I will fix it. I promise. I feel like crap about that asshole that caused me to do it. Uh, I, I, you know, I hate systems too. Like you're trying to do something and it, 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 it jumps. And that's what happened. I'm clicking on one and then the next comment comes in and it jumps. All right. <laughs> so we, we, we understand, I think, nitrogen fixation is well understood by most folks. You take the right bacteria and a legume species and it fixes nitrogen. Well, let's say you've done that. Let's say that we inoculated beans and they were one of our you know production crops through our, our, our main growing season and all that nitrogen is there. Let's say that we added a little bit of an organic fertilizer like Dr. Earth. Let's say that we've had some nitrogen because we had crop residue break down into the soil. Well, what happens even with good aggregation, if there's no plants there to take that nitrogen up, it ends up at least washing through and down to lower levels. We lose it. It's gone. So what is a nitrogen scavenger? A nitrogen scavenger is something like daikon radish. Again, it's very good at it. It'll take up a lot of nitrogen, and then when we kill it or it kills due to seasonality, it will stay available in our gardens. That's scavenging nitrogen. That's an incredibly com important component to cover cropping. And it's why I never, unless I'm in some sort of stuck point, cover crop with a single cover crop. It's always multi-species. And I always want something that's a good nitrogen producer and a good nitrogen scavenger and a good source of, uh, of nitrogen itself meaning lots of green growth and a good source of carbon. Something like cereal rye is a great source of carbon because after we kill it, it's going to dry out and we have a nice carbon layer on the surface. We want to be able to scavenge and hold that nitrogen in place. Um, it also builds organic matter for us. So for all the talk of soil organic matter, uh, if all we're doing to create organic matter is throwing mulch on top of our soil and compost, even if we're tilling it or what have you, we're, we're very much a surface action at that point, especially without deep tillage. And if we till deep, we're going to kill the soil over time. So we don't want to till at all. We certainly don't want to deep till. So if all we're doing is adding material to the surface and the only plant roots going into our system are our main production crops where so much energy is, is taken by us to eat it, then we're not building a lot of organic matter below the soil. But if we grow a cover crop, let's say a simple mix of cereal rye, daikon radish, and a legume like winter pea. When you look at, like, there's pictures of my garden I've put out recently with this huge amount of cover crop on the top 
there's as much root system below, and some of it goes very, very deep, two feet or more into the ground. When you kill that, all that organic matter that's below the soil it gets incorporated, it breaks down, there's less of it after it rots, but much of it's left over. And that be, that is how you increase soil organic matter. Now, if you want soil that is drought resistant, right, that grows resilient plants, one thing you definitely want in it is a high organic matter count. Here's an interesting statistic. This is true even on some organic farms that are not doing these practices, that are using organic chemical-based solutions. A lot of farms in the United States have less than 1% organic matter in their soil. Most conventional farms are lucky if they have two. Most of those are below one. Even a lot of our organic farms, one and a half to 3% is how much organic matter they have. Now you get up over five to seven, you have an almost indestructible soil unless you destroy the organic matter that's in there. And how do you destroy it? Tilling. Do you know why tilling works? It works because it kills everything and you're growing on the dead body. But since everything's dead, what happens next season? You're back to a chemical-based solution. Well, now we got to add nitrogen because we killed everything and there's nothing to produce nitrogen in our soil. And our organic matter le level, it goes down, 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 down across the soil. It's almost undetectable. But if we're constantly putting massive roots into that soil and we're never pulling them out, and we let the soil organisms consume them, eat them, rot them, and break them down. And at the same time, we're keeping a, a, a armor on the surface of the soil. Then everything will be good. Then everything will be good. By the way, I'm still distracted by this. If someone out there knows how to find a YouTube username in your back office on YouTube and unban somebody, please email me with TSPC in the subject line because I really want to unban this person. I did not mean to do that. That sucks so much butt because that's a great contributor that we have. And the person that caused it, you're just a troll little why? Anyway, moving on, we're building the organic matter above and below the soil. I want to get to the last part now so we can wrap up biochar. I, I did an over three hour episode on biochar from how to make it, how to use it, what it is. It, it, it's almost like a mini course in of itself. All you got to do is go to the survivalpodcast.com forward slash biochar. And if you do that, you'll be, you know, You'll, you'll be able to find all my resources on biochar because I'm going to kind of go surface level with this today because I have to, to cover these three things in a trifecta. Um, but the biggest thing that biochar does from a biological standpoint is it provides housing for microbes where they are protected. They're protected against getting too dry. They're protected against being consumed by things that want to eat them. They are protected against uh, rapid fluctuations in temperature, et cetera, because they have little apartments. So if we take a tiny little grain of biochar, so small you can barely see it. If you think about taking like a sharp pencil and making a little dot, so it's that big, and we put it that little dot under a microscope, a whole world emerges. Because we as humans have a hard time getting our head around the microbe space, how tiny it really is. And that little tiny dot of biochar is a planet to some of these critters, right? Maybe not a planet, a continent to some of these critters. That's how little they are. And if we look at it under that microscope, we see dozens and thousands of holes, little holes. Those are the structures within the plant matter that made the biochar. And each one of those can house colonies of some of these bacteria or fungi will simply attach and branch out from there and, and form symbiotic relationships and some predatory relationships. Well, fungi eats some of the all the soil microbes eat each other. That's something to understand. Now, I'm not saying everyone eats every other one. That's not what I mean. I'm just saying all of them eat something in the soil and often it's somebody else. Uh, I'm a big fan of going to the beach with my wife. We love to shell. And the more I've learned about shelling, the more I learn like all the shells you find, almost all of them are there because the thing inside of them is dead because something else with a shell killed it and ate it. The, the, all these mollusks, they all eat each other. That's how your soil organs, they all eat each other. Right? Again, there's certain ones eat certain other ones, but everybody eats somebody, right? Including fungi will literally like wrap a, 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 a structure around something like a, a pest nematode and dissolve it and eat it while it's still alive. 
that's what's going on down in the soil. And these uh, the biochar creates this environment where these critters can live. It also holds and equalizes moisture. When I talked about making potting soil with it, that's what I was getting at. Um, it will not just hold moisture, but if you have a pretty nice distribution of biochar, it will cause an osmotic reaction where the moisture will spread out. So think about it this way. If I took soil and I bury a dry sponge in the soil and then I water the soil and I let the soil dry out, pretty much, if I dig up the sponge, there'll be more moisture at that one point in the soil. But if I put hundreds and hundreds of sponges down in the soil, bury it and water it, well, even if I water it in one place, it will kind of spread out for me, won't it? Or if you think about it, if you take spon a sponge and put it in a pan of water and set another sponge on top of it and another sponge on top of it, and the third sponge is not even at the level of the surface of the water, walk away for a couple hours and come back, top sponge is wet, is one hands off to the other and they equalize throughout. That's one of the things that biochar does in your soil. It also holds on to that water. Biochar can hold 7.5 times its weight in water. Water is about 8.3 pounds a gallon. So about 1.1 to 1.2 pounds of biochar. For every 1.1, 1.2 pounds of biochar that you add to your garden over time, that's an additional gallon of water it can hold. That's a big deal, guys. And you, it's not just so your plants can have water. You want to kill your soil microbes? Let your soil dry out. There's two things that happens. A lot of the microbes give up the ghost and die. Some migrate as best they can. But again, you're talking about these, you're under an electron microscope to see some of these things, right? And certainly a high-powered microscope to see many other of these critters. What you think of is walking across a street, that's, that's a thousand generations of movement to get that far for those critters. So they really can't go anywhere. So some of them die, right? What happens to, to, to the other ones, they go into a dormant state and they emit a specific type of biogel. that's like a cocoon. And it says, don't wake me up until it's actually wet. And then your soil becomes hydrophobic and you water the crap out of it. And then you dig an inch deep and it's bone dry. That happens because it dried completely out in the first place. And it takes a heroic aquatic event to overcome that once it happens. So we do not want that to happen. We want to hold on and equalize that moisture, not just for the plants, but for the biology itself. Think of your soil like a fish tank. It's not that wet, but think of it that way, right? Think of it like a fish tank. What would happen to your fish if you took all the water out of the tank? Very quickly, they'll die. That's a lot of your so soil biology is dead. And it, 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 it's very difficult at that point for it to come back strong, especially quickly. Okay. So if we can hold that moisture, we keep it alive. It reduces the runoff of nutrients by holding onto this water. That's less nutrient that moves across and through and out of your soil profile. So it's incredibly important. Again, we're back to the main, like all three of these things help you build, increase, and hold. But each of them have something they're really good at it. Think of them like specialized generalists in the world, right? You got three doctors and all of them can do a surgery, but one's really good at opening. Another one's really good at doing the actual surgery. And another one is really good at putting everything back together and closing up the patient. It's not that they all can't do or participate in some, but there's a specialist for each component. That's And biochar, its specialization is holding. That's why we have soils in South America uh, with terra preta that 6,000 years ago were built by humans using biochar and other soil amendments, and they are still fertile, 6,000 years. Okay, is that sustainable? Is that regenerative? Which word are you going to use? I don't know, but it's beautiful is what it is. And we can build this in our own backyards. Biochar being a huge part of it. It also increases something called cation exchange capacity. It also increases anion exchange capacity, but CEC or cation is kind of the bigger one because it involves more nutrients and minerals. 
And all cation exchange is, is a measurement. It's a, a, a mathematical measurement. How easy is it for the soil and the plant to exchange nutrients with each other? And the higher that number is, the better. There, there are places where we grow food today. The cation exchange is, is like a two. That means it doesn't work at all. It's 100% chemical based. We can use biochar along with this other, the other parts of this biological solution, and we can make cation exchange in our soils, in our gardens, that are higher than the prairie soils before Europeans got to North America, and we can do it in a season or four. Somewhere between one and four seasons, depending on how bad things are and how dedicated we are, we can build cation exchange that rivals the systems that were maintained by wolves, Indians, and buffalo. That is amazing. And it's something that we really can't do with just cover crops and compost. We get, Again, we can do some of it, but there is an electrical magnetic type interaction that goes on with biochar that is a different level with things. And it's why I always include it in these discussions. Um, the next thing we need to do is start really thinking about this. Remember I said fish tank? Well, think of a saltwater tank, a reef tank. And when we first put the reef tank in, we put something called lava rock into the tank, and then we start adding corals that attach themselves. But even if we didn't do that, even if it just was rock, there's this massive amount of life that ends up living on and in the the holes of that rock system. Now, when we put biochar in the soil, again, it's easy for us to see something like a big, beautiful 400-gallon saltwater aquarium with lots of corals and stuff growing on and fish going in and out of it. It's hard for us to understand that that level of life we see is the minority of life that's in there. Most of that life is microscopic. But in the soil, it's really, you know, except for worms and beetles, it's all microscopic. And that little piece of biochar is like an entire coral reef system. And we can have millions of them simply by making biochar, inoculating, and getting into our systems. Again, if you want to know more about how to actually use biochar, the survivalpodcast.com forward slash biochar. Um, next up, you really, if you want something that's going to hold and last, then what, which of these three options would you like? Dissolves in a day, dissolves in a year, or lasts forever? And you would say, well, I want it to last forever, but that's not very realistic, is it? It is with biochar. Now, forever is... An absolute and absolutes generally don't work out if you push them to the extreme. So someday, for instance, no matter how good a job we do, the sun will 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 go to its next phase. It will start burning helium instead of hydrogen or fusing helium instead of hydrogen. It will turn red and it will start to grow. And eventually it'll get so big that it'll eat the Earth's orbit, completely incinerating us. So how permanent is anything? How forever is anything? When I say forever, I'm talking human lifetimes. And I think about the best we can do as humans right now, thinking forward and thinking about our children, their children, et cetera, is about seven generations. That's the reason the seventh generation meme has become a thing. It's because that's about how far out we can think. You know, I've got a son, that's first generation, grandson, second generation, great, would be third do that three more times, we're at six. Seventh, you're way out there. If you if you trace your genealogy back seven generations, you're looking at previous to the founding of the United States of America, in, in most instances for most of you guys. That's how long we're talking there. When you take biochar's longevity in the soil versus seven generations, seven generations is a second. It's thousands of years. So as people concerned with our environment and what we leave behind, no matter how much we care, no matter how much we do, we can only do so much. If we can do something that is still here and still beneficial to those we leave behind seven generations out, we've done our part. 
You can't ask much more for a man than for or a woman for them to do something. The, the children of children of children that they will never know will benefit from. So when I say forever, that's how I mean it. It is a forever solution. It is a forever solution because, again, we know we have places that have been discovered in jungles. And they do an analysis of the ground and they say there's not been a civilization here for 4,000 years. And they take that soil and it grows like nothing else we've ever seen. And you scrape the surface of it and take it away, which we shouldn't do, but they do it. They even sell it in bags. And it literally regrows because the solution is biological and there's enough depth of these coral reefs that it's not forever if you keep mining it, but it can handle what would destroy other ecosystems because it grows back because biology grows. See, chemical doesn't grow. Chemical is used by biological organisms metabolically for them to grow. Yeah. Or it destroys biology, one or the other, or both. But biology in of itself is a living thing that reproduces forever as long as it can. Yeah. Now, I am going to... Star a couple questions here. I've got like three. If you have a question for me, this would be a good time to ask that question. Put the word question in all caps, then ask your question and I will give you an answer. All right. So I want to go now to my final thoughts. These, technique th these techniques I hit on so frequently because they always work. Anyone can do them and they're long-term solutions. Just compost. Let's go back to just bioreactor style compost. We take some compost, we make an extract, and we put it onto our garden. One time, that's all we've done. The longevity of that action, if it's really good compost, and if there's something there for it to work with, if we have living roots in the system, if we have a reasonable amount of organic matter, if we've moved toward a good aggregation where water infiltrates instead of runs off, that action alone will have a lasting effect for years, for years. If we get the best organic fertilizer we can and throw it down there, maybe two seasons, if we're lucky, there'll be some impact. Now, if we take and we add to this a rotation where we're always either growing productive crops, cover crops, or even when we're doing our productive crops, we're interplanting crops we would think of as cover crops. That extends that action even longer. Now, when we add the biochar, we extend it infinitely unless it's blown up, dug up, or something. And so it's a long-term solution to get you off therapy. But at the same time, it is only, it is something anybody can do. There's nothing that I said today that's hard. Now, if you like what you hear and you want to know how to make the compost, I want to remind you guys I do have the bioreactor uh, compost course now available. It's only 40 bucks. If you're MSB, it's $35. Right? And I thought 35 bucks doesn't seem like a lot, but if I said 10%, you'd be like, that's pretty good. Well, 10% of 40 is only $4. So you get, you get a really decent discount as an MSB member because the course just isn't that expensive to begin with. If you go to homefoodsystems.com, you click on course list, list reg, uh, registration. You can see what's coming in the future, biochar and cover crops, right? But the simplified bioreactor composting is the one that you can take right away. It's six chapters. It explains everything. Uh, there's a course introduction video you can watch to get a better understanding of it. And I really recommend that you at least consider uh, taking the course. And uh, now I'm going to go ahead and try to start answering some questions for you. I've got four. If you don't hear your question when I get to three and you didn't just ask it, if you're not this person right here, uh, then you probably want to answer it again. So Curran Bishop says, how to use biochar? I'm making biochar in a chafing dish in my wood stove, producing a little a day. What's the best way to use it? Spread it on garden beds directly or in the chicken coop. The best way, in my opinion, to use biochar is to somehow incorporate it into your compost. In the chicken coop, assuming that you compost your chicken uh, bedding, which should, is a great way to do that. It has to end up 
in the soil if you're doing that, and it will be fully inoculated when you do. The kind of next best way, if you want to call it that, would be to mix it into compost as part of your potting soil. And something I just realized now that I skipped when I was talking about doing that. Let's say you don't have enough compost to make your own potting soil this year. You only have a little bit. Um, if you're buying your potting soil, I still suggest that then you bring in maybe 10% of your, so you have, you know, two buckets or five buckets of potting soil, half a bucket of your compost mixed into it. Add the biology to what you've bought. And then again, about 10% by volume of biochar to it. And use that when you start your plants. And, and this is why you're getting by bi you're getting biochar now and the biology vertically into your system. If we take something like, and I use these a lot for my uh, starts because they're very inexpensive. You can buy a giant bag of these things, red solo cups, like we all used to drink beer out of when we were in high school for two bucks a head at a keg party, right? You get a huge thing of these at like Costco or Sam's for next to nothing. I know it's plastics. When you put your holes in the bottom, all you have to do instead of using a drill and making all those little microplastic pieces is take a soldering iron and melt one big hole in the center. You can do about five cups at a time like that. It'll be a nice sealed off thing. Plant your plant in there. Now, this is about five inches tall. So when I plant this plant into my garden, whatever's in it, I've now created a five inch component of my soil profile that that material has gone into. That's another good way. What I really recommend if you have questions about biochar, char, the survivalpodcast.com forward slash biochar. I went into every way in that, that one episode that this stuff can be used. I had people who have been in the nothing but the biochar industry for, for decades that say they learned something watching that. And that says something about, I put, you know, a, a typical podcast like this today, I might have several hours of work into before I do it. That one, I probably had three weeks of work into. And I mean like three work weeks, like 120 hours of work before I put that one out. Um, Amy B says 10% is the general amount to have in the soil. And I think that was a question. So the number I gave you of 10% biochar in your, in your potting soil is not the same as 10% biochar in your garden soil. If you got up to like, you know, doing your volumetric uh, calculation on a foot of your soil, because, you, you know, you, not, you go down for infinity to get to the core of the earth, right? In a foot, and you got up to 1% to 2%, that would be actually really high. That's a lot of biochar. Biochar can be expensive. I don't personally think you can have too much. Some people say you can have too much. I think if you have a good biologically active system, you don't have to worry about that anyway. Uh, but if you, again, if you want to know more about using biochar, the course is coming. It'll be the, not the next course. It'll be the one after that. But you can definitely get started with kind of the, the, the you want to call it a free seminar that I did on how to do that. Uh, but, you know, make biochar, make compost and put them into your soil. Uh, John Hendricks says, ideally, how much biochar would you want to incorporate? Now, let's say if you had a 12 by 20 foot guard again, same answer I just gave, same answer I just gave, but there's a lot of ways to do this. I have a new tool. If you want to look it up, it's called a press planter and it's going to become an integrated part of everything that I do. It is mainly for planting seeds and applying fertilizer. There's two types of it. Again, it's called a press planter. Um, and or jab planter or press planter. I don't remember which one. It's actually the, the trade name of it. Very popular in Asia. The whole damn thing's got Chinese writing all over it. They use it on a lot of small farms. It's a cedar, and it's mainly used for larger seed. Let's say spinach, radish, and up. Buckwheat you could do, et cetera. But really like corn and beans and peas, and that's what it's designed to do. And every time you push it in the ground, it puts one seed in the ground, or two, depending on what seed disc you use. And there's a single version. All it does is just the seed. There's a dual version. It's got two compartments. And one side seeds and the other side is fertilizer. The other side is fertilizer in a conventional operation. So every time you plant a seed, just an inch away from it, there's a little pocket of fertilizer. And you can adjust the fertilizer side anywhere between a half a teaspoon and two teaspoons or half a tablespoon and two tablespoons, one, one or the other. And it's real simple to adjust. So what you could do with that, like mid-season fertility boost, 
makes up, you know, one-third compost, one-third biochar, and uh, um, one-third of an organic fertilizer, and then take your heavy feeders like your your peppers, your tomatoes, and all. Now we're not planting seeds with it. We're only putting things in on the fertilizer side, and around every plant, doom, 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 three injections of this coral reef and this biology and fertility all in one. That's the kind of thing I'm bringing forward in some of these classes as we keep going. Uh, hey, hey, Alabama says, when should things like radishes be planted? Well, it depends. If you want to eat radishes, cool, they're a cool weather crop. Uh, unless you live in the northern climate, they will bolt very quickly in the south. So you want to plant them in your spring or your fall. I think you mean for cover crops. Now, if you're if you're wanting to do a cover cropping uh, with radish, then either you want to plant them as you're coming out of winter, and then you're going to kill them as you go into your main planting, or you can interplant them and let them grow and flower if you want to, or you can kill them at any point in between by just basically crimping the top down. But for most people, a radish is going to be part of a cover crop mix going in, you know, ending your productive season and going into your dormant winter season, keeping that armor on. And it depends on where you are. I say daikon is very cold hardy. Other people say the first time it freezes, it dies. It all depends. Uh, in a multi-species cover, well-established, daikon will survive very cold temperatures, including some freezes. What, what they will not do is like tend to survive really hard freezes. So uh, I had daikon as part of my cover crop mix. We'll see if any of it makes it. But we just had two nights in a row where we were in single digits. It's probably all dead now. So how much growth do you want before that happens? So if you want a daikon that's two foot long and as big around as your wrist, you probably want four months. So where's your first hard freeze like that? Count back and plant then. Because if I tell you August, well, where do you live? That all changes, right? And a lot of people will say, well, I can't do it because then I would have to kill all my annuals that are still productive in August or September. Interplant. You can take your cover crop. This is a great strategy. Lay down your cover crop two to three weeks before you're kind of really at the end of your season. And then when you get to the end of your season, treat your annuals that were productive for you like a cover crop and kill them and leave the residue and let the cover crop grow up through it. That, that's a way that you can handle that. I'm going to check and see if we have any more questions here. Let's see. Tim, nope. Hey, hey, Alabama again. Question from Fred Lane. I chopped and dropped six raised beds. Should I put compost on top of the chop and drop and then cover with a tarp? That's a good strategy. Um, a better strategy would be to seed it with your cover crop do that and then a thin layer of compost or a compost uh, extract trench. But you're way late in the year to do that now, depending on where you are in the world, right? Um, if you're in a really cold climate, you're not cover crop planting anything right now. I had gotten really delayed, not my main garden, but kind of a secondary garden area, a group of six beds that I have. And I did not get a cover crop into them this year like I had planned until only a few weeks ago. Well, we had a little bitty stubble coming up because it's been so cold. And then we got hit with this hard freeze. Even the stuff like the cereal rye or the triticale or the blaze winter pea that would generally survive this when established, it probably all just got nuked. It was a risk and I'd rather do it than not do it. What I'll probably do there, and many of you that are in you know temperate climates can probably get away with still, is annual ryegrass, just know that it can be hard to kill. Now, where I'm going to put it, I don't care that it's hard to kill. It won't matter. And when it gets hot enough here, it dies. But there's always probably something that you can do. Uh, right now, Fred, what you can start thinking of is what's an early season cover that's easy to kill that you can plant as you get ready to go into your season. But you're going to probably have to get through the hard freeze risk to a degree anyway before you can do that. Uh Paul we O says Paul Wheaton mentioned on a different podcast that Google wood chips are longer lasting for biological activity for those of us in the stupid cold north. I think he means longer lasting than biochar, and I love Paul, but he's fucking high if he believes that. He's fucking high. And this is why. No matter how cool and moist you are, 
And no matter how long your hoogle lasts, it will rot to nothing. And your biochar never will. Your bio, I've had this discussion with Paul. He is incredibly close-minded about biochar. And I'm going to tell you that other than the fact that he can name a kiln uh, by design, like say, like a, a T-Lug kiln, he knows nothing about biochar. And it's not because he's not smart, and it's not because he's not right about a tremendous number of things. He's disinterested, therefore he hasn't learned. And biochar can and will work anywhere. Does it work better in warm climates? Better being subjective? Probably. If you have high organic matter, cool soils with lots of biological activity in it, it will still work, but the gain you see will be less. But does it hold? What's better? Wood chips that last, let's say, 10 years buried in the ground or wood core buried in the last 10 years or a charcoal that lasts thousands of years. Which one lasts longer? Math. That's all you got to do is do math right there. Uh, William Starr says the one I'm talking about is called a jab planner. I keep saying press planner, jab planner, probably because I would have named it a press planner instead of a jab planner. I think it's a better name. And 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 so that's why that's the case. Um what do I think about a broad fork in heavy clay soils? I think that if you're starting with heavy clay soils and you need to do something and you don't want to take a longer term solution, that a broad fork, which is basically it looks like a big heavy duty pitchfork, you push into the ground and you rock it back and forth. You don't actually turn the soil over. I think it's a fine solution. I don't care how heavy your clay is. Once you start establishing a rotation like we're talking about, you've got good biology with your compost. You've got cover crop whenever you're not in productive plantings. It's keeping an armor on the soil. It's keeping a growth of organic matter. It won't matter. You won't need to do it anymore. But if you need to do it for a season or two, it beats the hell out of a true dig or a tilled system. You're still creating soil disturbance, but it's a lot less. If you wanted to do it every year, I wouldn't tell you you're wrong but I would tell you, you probably don't need to. But this is something I, when I just did the live class to finish up the bioreactor compost class that I showed my students a few different ways in what we do here. And I'll say something like, you know, this season's compost, I'm not as pleased with it as the previous seasons. And they'll say, well, did you put it under a microscope and go all Matt Powers on or something? And no, no. What I do is I put the two things side by side and I look at the results. Because that's what we really care about is, in the end, do I get bigger, happier, healthier tomato plants? Am I in a part of Texas where tomatoes notoriously get destroyed by blight every year, and I'm still picking tomatoes off of my tomato vines one day before the first freeze? That's how I know which one's better. So you can do the same thing. Let's say that you have heavy clay soils, you establish several garden beds. And you, you get into this process, these three techniques, and you're using them, and everything's going really good. And you think, maybe I don't need to be broad forking anymore. Maybe I'm actually creating a negative by doing this, right? Maybe I'm getting a burst, but my long-term quality is going down because I'm still creating a disturbance, and I'm still creating kind of an underground compost. I'm still burning up life. Are you or are you not? Since I've never really used a broad fork, since I've discovered how to do this, I don't know. But if I was concerned about it, I would take some of my beds and I would broad fork them. And I would take some of my beds and I would not broad fork them. And I would do it for at least a couple seasons and I would everything else would be done the same. And at the end of that process, if I saw no difference, I'd stop broad forking. If the broad forking stuff was doing better, by the end of the second season, not the beginning of the first. It's very important to think again long term. If the broad fork system was doing better by the end of the second season, I would keep that technique in my system. If it wasn't, if it was the same or less, I would cease doing it because we're creating a soil disturbance, if that makes sense. Now, yes, we're opening soil, we're creating infiltration and all, but I want you to think in the term of networks about your soil. Fish tanks are one good enough, but networks are another. And I mean, you think of millions of strands of communications cabling or roads in cities in your soil. And then I want you to think about you have all these roads, all these canals, all these connections within your network. 
and you stick your broad fork down in there and you rock it back and forth and you haven't turned the soil over, but this is what happened to your network. Rip. It's all torn apart, at least the piece that you did. Now, I'm not saying it's destructive. I'm saying that some level of tearing the network apart, you have now done. So if you can, if you can, and this is the other thing, I'm a big on elimination. There's a lot of things I've eliminated that I compared the results and said, well, let's put that back in there. But there's a lot of things I eliminated. Nothing bad happened or things got better. Well, we're not going to do that anymore because it's another piece of equipment. It's another thing to do. It's more labor. It's more effort. So I don't hate broad force. I know that's kind of a long answer, long answer to a simple question, but it's the best way I can do. I think that's about it for our questions today. Again, I want to remind you, you can take uh, the bioreactor course now. It is available 40 bucks. I really think... I haven't heard a single complaint by the people taking it so far at all. Uh, if you are taking it and you're getting a lot out of it, I'd love to have testimonials from some of you guys that are enjoying the course, but I haven't had any complaints. I think if I charge $99.99 for this course, I don't think anybody would complain. So do consider taking it. Also remember, if you like the work that we do here and you want to support us, whenever you shop online, no matter what you buy, you can do your online shopping at tspaz.com. That's T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. Today's item of the day is from my favorite, absolute favorite value brand electronics company, Anchor, A-N-K-E-R, the Astro E7 28,000 or 26,000 milliamp hour portable charger is on sale today for 32% off. That's 22 bucks. This thing is a beast. It is my favorite uh, charger. I have several of them. Mine are years old, and they still work as good as the day I bought them. I don't know how long they last, but definitely several years, and they still work beautifully. They have a tremendous capacity. They'll charge an iPhone about nine times. Uh, a big Galaxy, they'll charge about six. You get about two charges of an iPod, uh, an iPad Air. Uh, so they just have a just a hoss amount of reserve power. They work beautifully, and Anchor stands behind everything that they do. And again, they are on sale today at a great price. This is one of those products that's not always on sale. There's some stuff that like it's on sale more than it's not. These they put on sale a couple, three times a year. So I would definitely consider picking one of them up if you don't have a good backup power solution for your cell phone. And let me tell you that you should. When it comes to emergencies, grid down, et cetera, your cell phone is your lifeline to get information and to send information. Uh, even a lot of times when maybe cell service itself isn't working you can often still get text messages out or things you know you send text messages they kind of sit there in limbo you get a connection for a moment they go out you get a connection for a minute they come back in having that ability to communicate gather information etc is huge and nothing nothing is really more important in those situations than comms and backup power i want to put it to you this way let's say you get eight charges of an iphone off of one of those you're in a, a power out situation. You should be rationing your phone. You don't sit there and play games on it in this situation unless you have good, like a generator or something going on. But you're somewhere and you're stuck and you have that power apparatus in your phone. You can keep that phone running. If you turn it off when you're not using it, you, you know, turn it on a few times a day, check for inbound stuff. You keep it running for weeks, for weeks and you can get it for again 30 percent plus off today so remember no matter what you buy if you start your online shopping at tspaz.com uh we can help you out or you can help us out uh no matter what you eventually buy and if you go to tspaz.com and you look through my reviews everything there i own it i bought it i would buy it again or it's not there and sometimes you'll even find products from older reviews and it'll say right at the top i no longer recommend this item there's nothing wrong with it just I found a better one. I found a better solution, a better value for your money, or they don't make this anymore. Here's my replacement for it. I never take those things away. I always leave that archive there. I think if you go on the record and endorse something, you should stand behind it. And if something better comes along, you should still stand behind your original endorsement and say, but here's what I recommend now and why. My brand is integrity. That's incredibly important to me more than just about anything else I do. I don't care if somebody hates me. I don't care if anybody thinks I'm a dick. I don't care if anybody comes up here. I might get rid of you if you just become annoying with it, like I did with a guy today, uh, and say, I don't know what I'm talking None of that stuff really matters to me. I've got 15 years behind me. You can look at my track record and decide whether you want to follow what I do or not. That's fine. 
When someone questions whether I'm speaking the truth, that's where I get pissed. I really do because the one thing I want, I don't care if somebody, he's the biggest asshole on planet earth. As long as they're like, but he, he believes what he's saying, I'm okay with that. I'm not okay with it the other way around. You can love me and think I'm a liar and I don't, I don't like that at all. So everything I endorse, I will always stand behind. And if it changes, I will come back to you and tell you that it's changed and why that it's changed. And if you ain't going to do that, don't become an influencer. Don't become a podcaster. The TV's full of assholes that'll shill anything they're asked to shill. Go do that. Stay away from this alternative media space. It's not going to happen. All of those shills are coming into the world of podcasting now after all these years. Uh, but the real podcasters out there, I think most of us are like this. We're real people. You can talk to us. You know, I think one of the big things that makes podcasting so successful, and this is why the mainstream trying to skin it, can't really skin it. The relationships we develop with our audience, even when we don't know it, there's no way I can have a relationship with everybody that listens to this show. It's not possible. The numbers, I'm very blessed to say the numbers make it impossible. But I have people I've never met. They know the names of my dogs, my grandkids, my wife, where I live what my favorite sports team is, what fish I like to catch, what I like to cook. The people on the talking heads and empty suits on TV, they will never have that. They can't. They can't have that form of relationship because they have to reserve who they really are so they can do whatever they're asked to do. So I'm going to ask you something today that I didn't plan on and it has nothing to do with me personally. Please support real podcasters. Please support people that take their time and energy and weekly or daily or some something in between the two, pour out everything they have to speak the truth to you as they've discovered it. Whether it's current events, whether it's stuff like we talk about with growing your food, whether it's people that are like just, you know, like a physicist that makes physics understandable to the average person. I don't care what Bitcoin podcasters, if they're genuine. Please, in some way, support them because I'm going to tell you, we are under attack. They hate us. They hate us because they can't be like us. They hate us because a podcaster can pick a little tiny niche that they can never afford to thoroughly cover. Like, I don't know, I, I'm wearing a, a fishing guide, my favorite fishing guide, uh, Omar Cotter at Luck of the Irish. You know, he specializes in white bass and stripers. That's it. That's all he fishes for. Now, if you catch something else, great, but that's what he specializes in as a guy. You can have a podcast about nothing but that. Do you think mainstream media can compete with that? No. So we can go as wide as we want or as narrow as we want as podcasters, and they can't do it, and they hate us for it. They hate us because we can tell the truth because we're not beholden to anybody to tell a lie. So please whether it's through podcasting 2.0 apps like Fountain or what have you, uh, whether it's through zapping people or buying their products or buying from their sponsors when they have good sponsors, one way or another, not just me, support alternative media and support podcasting because the world is a different place today because of podcasting. I didn't say because of my podcast. Podcasting, I-N-G, the total space. There was no truth coming out of mainstream media at all during COVID. I'll just start with that. Now think about every other place and every other time that's been true. Podcasting has changed the world for the better. Please support other podcasters. Thank you for tuning in today. Hopefully the dog just didn't eat the uh, HVAC tech. I'll catch you guys tomorrow with another episode.